Hi everyone, I didn't expect to be back in front of you quite so soon. In my last video I mentioned a Zoom new user group for Family Historian. You'll see the email address for the administrator here behind me. At present this Zoom group meets every Tuesday. The meetings go on for about an hour, hour and a half. You can jump in and jump out whenever you want. And generally there's a presentation from one user on a specific subject, followed by a bit of discussion. Even though it's called a new user group, there are at least six experienced Family Historian users on there. Every time I sit in I learn something, and so do some of the long term users. I've been lucky enough to be given permission by one relatively new user, Philip Leslie, who's been around Family Historian now for about six months, and he gave a presentation in November 2022 to the group. I'll let Philip introduce himself, he was previously with TMG, and the full recordings of these meetings are available if you join up for the Zoom group. So again, the email address is above me, so why not shoot Derek off a mail? Sit in, watch some of the videos. The other thing I want to mention quickly before I move on is the Roots Users Group. If you drill into that, there's also videos there available for download. So let me hand over to Phil and um, let's hear how he customises Family Historian to suit his needs. Good evening, everybody. So my name's Phil Leslie. Uh, I've been using Family Historian for about four or five months now in earnest. I only really discovered it in January, February this year. Prior to that, I've been using TMG version 9 uh, for about 20 years. So quite established with TMG. I uh, love the product. Very disappointed when it went into decline. I did consider Legacy 9 to transition to for a good three or four months and struggled with the conversion using their conversion process. And I wasn't overly impressed with Legacy 9. And then I discovered Family Historian 7. I think it was a Who Do You Think You Are review at the back of 2021. It described Family Historian as being one of the more challenging ones to learn and to get to grips with, which sounded interesting to me. So I thought that sounds like one to explore. And I was pretty impressed with Family Historian 7. I found it the most similar to TMG that I was using. I didn't think it was quite as good as TMG, but I thought with the conversion process, I'll go with it and see what happens. I'm quite impressed, pretty impressed with Family Historian 7. And I'm currently on Family Historian 7.15. I think that was one of the questions that somebody asked earlier, what version we're we using. So that's the version that I'm going to be playing around with today. So I'm still a newbie compared with some of the guys that are out there. I see Jackie smiling and I know Trevor's probably smiling as well. I'm a newbie, so don't ask me too many challenging questions. But what the plan, what my objective is today is really to show you how I've configured Family Historian 7 to suit the way that I manage data. Hopefully you can see my instance of Family Historian. The first thing we're going to do is we'll just have a look at some properties. So we'll go through what preferences I've got. So we'll go to tools, preferences. Now, some of my ideas may not be the liking of everybody, but I'll just explain why I've done it in some ways. So the first one on general is display surnames in uppercase. You can see here, hopefully I could use the annotate if I wanted to. So that one there, I've unticked that one. I don't like uh, displaying surnames in uppercase. You'll see on the screen behind all the surnames in lowercase. That's how I did configured in TMG and I've done that. I'm quite a metric guy. So I've configured everything in centimetres. That's the only other one I've changed on that particular screen. In terms of display, display, I've got my toolbar in small. I quite like to get as much real estate as possible on the screen. So I've gone for a, a small toolbar and include key diagrams, which is this one here. I've got that ticked as well, which is different to the standard. So what I'm basically showing you here on all the screens is which ones I've chosen, which are not uh, the defaults. So I've gone for medium on that one, one on that one. I've displayed surnames in, in uppercase. Startup, I know a couple of people, I think the guy on the last call talked about how he had the de default startup file left blank. So that every time he started up Family Historian, it gave him a list of projects that he wanted to select. Where I've gone for my default project. In terms of the focus window, I've played around this a little bit a lot. I don't like a lot of images at the top. 
So I've reduced the maximum number of images at the top down to three. I'm very impressed in terms of family historian with the ancestor tab here and the descendant tab. That's superbly, exceptionally superior to what I was experiencing before. But with the, the real estate that I've got, on the screen, you can see that I've changed the descendant uh, generations up to five. And the last thing that I do have that I've selected is record I IDs. I'm very heavy into record IDs. I store all my images, all my documentation, all my files outside of Family Historian in a file structure that I've created. In terms of internet data matching, I only have Find My Past. I don't have a subscription to my heritage, so I've disabled my heritage. And I do prefer when I am clicking on uh, the prompts within Family Historian to launch an external web browser. So I've, I've ticked that one as well in here. In terms of property boxes, I like, and again, this was a subject that somebody else was discussing. I can't remember it was last week, whether it was Trevor. I like my citations, as you can see here, at the bottom of the screen, even when the property box is uh, docked or floating. One thing I'm going to come back to later is captions, because I've made a few changes to captions in here as well, so I'll cover that a little bit later on. Records window, the only sort of change I've made in the records window is the double click on named list. I've got that text, so whenever I'm in uh, the names list, and I double click on a person, it automatically brings that person up in the uh, property box. I quite like that as a, as a concept. Advanced, I've done nothing in there either. Media, not done anything. Map window, I've picked up through fair numerous family history user group discussions that it's better to block the refresh of non-tentative geocodes. The default is to have that open. But I believe that helps the performance of maps and I've, I've, I've used that one quite effectively. Map search, not done anything. Query window, not done anything. File load and save, not done anything. Workspaces, whoops. The only one I've changed in here as a default is the records window. I've got that one set as docked. The default is to have it floating. But I quite like when I ever do anything, double click on anybody or access anything, having the records, having the, the record window uh, docked rather than floating around. You can always click on the icon to, to float it if you want to do so. Estimates, I'm quite happy with all of those, not change anything. Name lists, I can't remember what the default is in here, so I don't think there is a default, but I've got some bookmarks, work in progress and key individuals. I make use of all three of those, and you'll see that as I go through a little bit and show you how I've got it configured. Uh, backups, I've got my backup folder set. The last one, international, not made any changes in any of that stuff. So I haven't made a huge number of changes in basic preferences, but enough to make it look and feel a bit like the way that I want it to work myself. The next thing I want to show you in terms of really simple config uh, changes that I've done, and I know I think Trevor had it when Trevor was showing last week, is that over here in this window here, you can see that I've got myself individual for Leslie, and I've also introduced a poll number, and I've also got the fact that I am the root at this moment in time of my particular project. One of the things that I noticed when I first started playing around with Family Historian was that this information, who is the relationship of a person? So again, this is my wife, Diana. She's the wife of Philip Andrew Leslie. That only seemed to appear if I double clicked on my wife in the top left-hand corner up here. And I twigged just watching some family uh, user group uh, emails that it was possible to add that into this window over here. I'll talk about Paul in a few minutes, but just to make that change, to add Paul and the fact that this person's relationship to root appears is a really, really easy thing to do. So the way to do it is if we're going to tools and preferences, we'll end up in property box and this option here called captions. Now this toolbar up here is this first line in the individual text here. So if what I'm going to do to start with, I'm just going to sc screenshot that, copy it, tick it. I'll just blow it up a little bit so you guys can see it. So that text 
that I've copied in looks like that. I don't think it'll stretch quite well enough. But the absolute default, the default that appears in Family Historian is just this little bit here that says the individual at the top there is an individual. And what I've added or what I've worked out how to add is then to add the word pool and then the pool number, which is equal relationship pool, then a semicolon. So that basically says pool space, in my case, number one. That means I'm basically the the pool family in my project. And I'll explain a little bit about pools later on. And then the second bit is then a quite a nice piece of complicated logic that took me head getting to get around with to start. But that basically says the next block of logic here is using a, a construct called combined text. The first empty quotes is a prefix. So if I typed in here, Fred, then what we'd see before the word father-in-law is the word Fred. And I don't want that. So I've left that blank. And then basically it says, if the relationship of file root has a value, then it will print at the top of here of and my name. So it will print the relationship to me, then the word of, and then whoever file root is. And if this relationship to file root is blank, it will then print, print in the top screen there, no direct, direct relationship to, and then file root. Every time I click on somebody else, I end up with the relationship of that person to myself. I'll talk about pool a little bit. Uh, pool's quite an interesting one. Pool is something that I didn't have in TMG, and I found a really interesting concept in Family Historian. To sort of talk about pool, I'm going to go to the individuals window, and we'll look at how I've got it configured here. So you can see that I've got myself as root. I happen to also be the first person that was ever created in my project. As if I look here, you can see I've sorted by pool. So everybody, pool basically means that everybody that's related directly or indirectly through my wife to myself has the same pool number. If I just sort this by ID, you'll see that this person here is in pool number two. This person has got no maternal, paternal, any formal relationship through to me, but is part of my database. And what I can do is I can look at, if I sort by pool, hopefully if I scroll down slowly enough, we'll come across some other people that are part of pool number two. Let's see if I can find Goodwin. There you go. So John Goodwin, who was the first one at pool number two, I can see John Goodwin's wife is also in pool number two and their two children are in number two. So the way that pools work in Family Historian, the way the system works is pool numbers are quite arbitrary. Unlike ID numbers that are fixed, pool numbers, when they're assigned, they will change every time that you log into the system. So it basically starts off with the lowest ID number, finds everybody that's related to that person and assigns it pool one. Then it looks for the next person that's not related and assigns it pool number two. And if we just sort by tool and get pool go down to the bottom, you can see that I've got Mr. John Good in there with his family of four. Then it finds the next highest ID that's not related and anybody that's related to them and assigns it three. Then the next highest ID and assigns it to four, etc. The next highest person and their group. So it's a really interesting way of looking at people that are not directly related to either yourself or the root person within the project. And it allows me to filter out and remove people that I don't think are any more relevant uh, to my family. And that's a feature in uh, Family Story that, as I said, did exist in TMG and I found really, really useful. And I'm, I've started monitoring that a little bit more. I keep reviewing people that I've got in here and deciding, do I really want them or do I really not want them? Just to make sure that my project's uh, as close as close as I, as I possibly can do. If anybody else has found poll numbers useful in that sort of respect. I've got 800 in mine. 800, have you? Yeah. Well, the yeah, thing but, for me... But then it's a very big one-name study, so... Yeah, well, it was it was a concept that I hadn't come across before until I, you know, started using Family Story and uh, John. So it, it was a bit of a, an eye-opener to me, and I've, I've, I think it's a really fantastic feature. I use it a lot when um, tracking DNA people, because I have one brick wall... Um, on my uncle's DNA and my great-grandfather, we've no idea who or where he came from. So from 
ancestry, I'm picking up all the DNA families over on his side of the tree and plotting them in a separate project. And all of a sudden you find that you've already got somebody duplicated. So where they were in separate pools, they now merge together because they're the same blood group. And I find it's pretty useful in trying to work out who's who from the DNA point of view. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is quite impressive, really. So while we're on this particular screen here in the records window, let's just talk about individuals and how I've customised these. And again, I've seen a couple of other people on a few of the, the presentations that we've done this week over the last few weeks, how they've changed it. One of the big criticisms I think I have got of Family Historian is that out of the box, if I just use this right click and go to restore defaults, out of the box, I found a lot of the screens very unhelpful. So this is the default view of the individuals tab. Uh, there's no pool on here. Uh, the addresses that I've got look fairly ugly. Just sorted by the records ID. I've got the relationship on here as well, which is okay, I suppose. If I want to see the addresses, I've got to do all that. And it took me a while to twig uh, that I can use the right click on the toolbars to actually then decide which columns I wanted on here. And the other one that it took me a while to twig, and I think, again, it was only by reading the, the user group forum, I twigged that in here, in the options, there's quite a nice feature, which is an active by default. Again, if I restore defaults, you'll see that this option here disappears to include husband surnames when you're searching on people. One of the things, again, I've struggled with family historian is the lack of not being able to create a maiden name automatically when I create a, a marriage record. Uh, I do have a lot of maiden names, but I've stopped doing it since I discovered this, this feature here. So this is quite a nice feature because if I look at somebody, if I, I look at somebody called somebody called Hagstrom, we'll go for Bertha. So by typing in Hag, it's brought up everybody that's got Hag as a surname and a Burr as a uh, Christian name or a forename. And you'll see that two people have appeared here straight away, uh, Bertha, Bertha Sharp and Bernadine Road. They're appearing here because if I double click on either of those and look at the marriages, I can see that Bertha Sharp married Harold Edwin Hagstrom. So it's actually picked up the hag from the maiden name or it's picked up the hag from the, the husband's surname. And again here with uh, Bernadine Road, it's picked up that she married a Hagerman uh, also. And I find that quite a nice, quite a nice feature. So I've got the options, I've included that one there. I find this compared with TMG a little bit lacking. I quite like when I'm looking at individuals to be able to see who the fathers, uh, mothers, spouses are. Again, if we just click on the, the toolbar at the top here, you can see how you can configure the columns. So one of the things, I don't know if everybody's played with this or anybody's played with this, is quite powerful and it's quite nice to get your head around, is that you can then decide what columns you want to add into this here. So if I want to add flags, and I noticed, I think, it, again, it was Trevor last week, I'd added quite a few flags in here. Uh, you can do so. You can add uh, parents, uncles, and things like that. And the other nice thing about it is that once you start at configuring things, if I just add marriage date, we'll add that in there and just move it up a bit. Occupation, add that in there and move it up a bit. It's really easy to come up with something that you feel happy with. And if you think that looks like a good template, the other thing that I would recommend doing is in configure columns is then saving that, which means that if in the future, you do an upgrade or you do make a mistake and change something or restore the defaults by accident. If you save the view that you've got to a name, and I could call this one, I'll call it Fred, for want of a better word, save it. And if I restore the defaults at some point in the future and thought, oh, heck, where's my bespoke version gone? I can simply go in here, load from query, Look down in the list here, see if I can see Fred. There we go, Fred. Click on OK. They all come back and magically I've got my customised view back in there. So one of the things that I have done, if I go back into configure columns, I've created my own view for my, my custom individuals, which looks like that. So basically I've got my name, my ID, my IDs, my pools, my relationships, my 
birthplace, uh, parents, mothers, spouses. And I've kept the last updated in here as well. Stephen Paul, you've probably done something similar, configured these in different ways. I know some of you have input census flags in here and various other bits and pieces. It's, it's really quite a powerful feature of family store and to be able to do that. Yep, I've got quite a few layouts. But something yeah. I think you may have missed is the little tick under the individual, the plus sign under the individual records against the individual. If you click on that, you can now go down and see who the parents are, who your spouse is. And if you click on the little box uh, to the right of, say, your parents, uh, left a bit, right a bit, the, the, the tick box, that one, it will show you the parents. You can then see their father and mother and so on. You can actually draw right down through that family just by going on those pluses. Very impressive, isn't it, Paul? John uh kindly sent out uh, a query uh, that he uses and i think uh, i think derek did you upload that to the site it was very useful i think i did put a link the other thing you can do is when you when you are playing around in here if there is something that's there by default so relationship for instance that gives you a clue as to what the the expression is that's behind that particular column and that's quite useful to be able to copy and paste elsewhere and that's, that's really where I sort of twigged that I could take that value relationship pool and paste it into uh, the tools to get it into the header frame for the uh, property box. Uh, I'm not gonna oh, the other thing I was going to talk about, I think everybody knows, I think there was enough talked about it, how easy it is to click on a column, sort a column. Uh, another quite nice fast track, if you press the Alt, Alt key on your keyboard, and then click, that does it in reverse. Uh, I know you can do the same by right clicking on the title and saying sort descending, but I quite like fast tracks. So I like be able to do it by pressing alt keys and things, things like that. Notes I haven't changed a great deal. Sources, I've added some more columns to sources. Uh, and I know sources, I think Trevor might have said it last week or somebody else said it. Sources. It was Paul last week. Was it? Yeah, somebody said they wouldn't talk about sources, repositories, and all the rest of its citations to save the life because it's such a contentious area. But these are all my sources. Again, compared with the default, if we go back to what is the default for it, I didn't particularly find that particularly, particularly interesting. So what I have done is configured some columns Mine. So for a source, just to get a flavour for it, I was interested in, uh, for each source, what's the repository for that source, what was the template, how many links have I got to that source, have I got any images and things like that attached to it. So I've played around with that. And again, what I quite often do is use this to help cleanse what sources I've got in the system. Repositories I've bespoke as well. So those are the repositories that I've used over the years. What's my uh, repository name, details, website, sources, media. We could spend hours talking about that one. And places. So, so the last, last one I've got is research notes, which, again, I've really heavily customised. So research notes, I've, I've, I've heard lots, of, lots and lots of criticisms on research notes. And when I first came in here and all my research notes were converted from TMG, I looked at this screen here and thought, what on earth is that telling me? I found that really unhelpful altogether. So what I then did was, okay, looked at research notes and looked at the data that I had in a research note and then try to work out how I could add some of this information into this browse. So if we go back to configure columns and we'll load my research notes, I came up with something that looks like this. I've basically, as I mentioned right at the very outset, I've got four families I'm interested in. Leslie's myself, Alison's my mother's line, uh, Martin's my wife's parent, father, and Weston's. So what I've worked out is how to add a column in here that allows me to look at each of my different family lines 
I've also looked worked out how to add a priority against a research note. So I can say, what are my priority one tasks, two tasks, etc. And I also worked out how I could break my research notes down into area. So I could say, these are all my research notes around the 1841 census, 1870, 1880, 1890. I've got some stuff around Scotland. So when the next time I'm feeling flush, and I can afford to pay for the Scotland subscription, I might investigate those. What I worked out is a way of reclassifying, I think, my research notes. If we look at a research note, whereas what I've done is I've used the templating within Family Historian to create a, a structure for a research note. And you can do that quite easily if you want to do so in tools. And I think the concept is called auto text. So in here, what I've done is I've basically created I used add to create a, a task. If we look at the task that I've created, I've created basically a blank template that says, this is the title, who is the person, date, family priority, what is the task, what is the status, and then a bit of a toolbar. Again, really easy to do that sort of stuff. The reality is that anything that starts with a word that ends with a colon becomes what's generally known as a, what I would call a field name. All of these field names, such as title, person, date, family, you can see that at the top of this browse here, I've basically said this field, family, becomes this column here. This field called priority becomes that column there. Task becomes that column. So it's really easy to then cut or use these fields and stick them into the browse. So if we look at this one here, Title is 1841 census, which appears automatically there. Person, Henry Smith. And as I've already mentioned, I quite like ID numbers. So I've got the ID number there and that appears here. To date, obviously, family becomes Western. Priority, number one. I, I simply use priority one to four. One is high, two is lower, three, as you can guess, four is lowest. And the status open. I sometimes change that to being work in progress, so I know which uh, task is work in progress or not. That really does allow me then. Oh, and the other thing that I do I quite like is I, I, I use the links quite a lot. So when I'm creating a, uh, a research task, I'll use add link to an individual record. So let's say this thing was also linked to that person there. You can see it puts a link in there. So the next time I open the task up and I think, okay, I need to do something with Henry Smith. All I've got to do is click on Henry Smith and it opens up in the screen. That's quite nice. So again, if I've got a, ta uh, a task that's got multiple people, I could have several uh, strings under here. If it's Gordon Brown, it links me to Gordon Brown as well. All I'm really trying to show you is how easy it is to configure, how easy it is to save something that you've created how easy it is to play around with it and load it once you've played around with it and help you configure Family Historian. The last one I did want to sort of talk about is places, but I think, John, you said you're going to talk about places yeah. <clears throat> next week, so I won't steal your thunder on that one. The only one that I have done on places, if we go to plugins, I use this, I've used this one very successfully. Find duplicate place names, John. Yeah. That one I, I use quite a lot because, as I've already said, if I go back to myself, go back to home, if I create a fact for myself, we'll go for Huddersfield. Quite often, I'm, I'm as inaccurate as everybody else. I mistype commas and things like that and save it. And I do find that plugin quite useful to look for duplicate place names. And what it'll do is say that is potentially a duplicate of that. And again, what it allows me to do quite nicely, if we do that, edit, merge. And again, because I've got these things here, I can say, yeah, I want to keep Huddersfield. I want to merge that with Huddersfield. Well, I found that extremely informative. And I want to thank Phil again for allowing me to share that in an abridged version. 
If you're serious about genealogy and you want to learn more about the powers of Family Historian and discuss that with other serious users, then I would suggest joining up for the Family Historian Zoom Users Group. This is mostly new users, as I said earlier in the video. There's also about six users around there that have been using the program for a long, long time and know all the ins and outs. My next planned video is on the basics of queries. Just to get users into the basics and help them overcome any fear they'll have of queries. It's very simple. All you're doing is asking your database questions and you can get some very good answers out that help you progress your research. As always, if you found this useful, give it a thumbs up. Perhaps there'll be more abridged copies of presentations from the Family Historian Zoom group. So if you want to get notifications of those videos, click the subscribe button down below, followed by the bell. Once again, thanks for watching.